I was asked to introduce our speaker this evening, Russell Burrill. <laughs> For those of you who, who are new this evening, I'll, I'll tell you the essential facts. Those who are not new probably know this and a lot more about Russ. First thing is that he's the founder of this organization. He and a few others, 20 years ago, began the Army Air Force Roundtable. And it's dedicated to remembering the wartime experiences which he and his buddies had, his comrades in arms had, serving during the Second World War. Russ was on a, a, a ground crew in England, and his life, like every World War II soldier, was scarred by the experiences of being comrades with those, many of them, who did not return. He's going to speak about his wartime experiences, and especially on how to run a war, or at least how it was run back in Russ's day. Please welcome Russ Burrell. can't possibly forget it. Uh, I heard Jimmy Stewart say one time that he didn't think about a lot, he didn't talk about a lot, but he thought about a lot. And I think it impinges upon your thoughts once a day at least, if not more. Uh, now I have this presentation tonight, and I could not have done this alone. I haven't got the slightest idea of how it's done, but John uh, Farrell, our treasurer, uh, spent about four or five hours over the house one day uh, working with me on this. Uh, I'd like to start off by saying that Station 468, Ruffin, was a small village, beautiful little place, about 65 miles northeast of London. We were surrounded by other 8th Air Force fields. And we were close to a city, very St. Edmunds, which was a beautiful city. There is. Uh, it's a medieval city. There is a, a Benedictine Abbey uh, in very St. Edmunds. It's where the body of Queen Anne of the Scots is buried. Uh, the rest of her, her head, doesn't seem to be there. Uh, so she, she lost her head in the process executed by her sister, Queen Elizabeth. Uh, there's, a, there's a hotel in Barrie, it's called the Angel Hotel, and there's a plaque on one of the room doors. It says, in this room, Mr. Pickwick stayed one night, and it's mentioned in Pickwick papers. Uh, if I uh, make a mistake in forwarding this, I have my expert opinion here, sir. Five. This is a sign that was put up by our Alumni Association. It's a group of Englishmen who got together and asked the farmer who owned the land if they could have the control tower. And he called them back and he said, yes, I'll do you one better. I'll give you a quarter of a mile area around the control tower. And the control tower is now a museum. Uh, and our CO at the time was Colonel Castle who was killed in 1944, but this is where the sign comes from, the home of the 94th bomb group. Uh, there's no particular order to these. I put this one on first because May 29th was our eighth mission, and 30 men in our squadron did not come back. Up to that point, our group had lost three when we lost the three this date, it brought the total to six out of eight missions. Uh, Bob Hope found out that there was a mission taking off at 11 o'clock in the morning. So he said, well, in that case, we'll do two, two uh, uh, shows today. One at 9.30 in the morning for the crews that had to go, and he out at 1 o'clock in the afternoon. 
uh, Francis Langford and I think Jerry Colon was with him, but I am not sure. Uh, this is the ground echelon on the ground of B-17F, and I don't understand why the wings didn't collapse uh, right. or anything else. Uh, B-17 had a propensity to spread its landing gears out if it was overloaded, like the bonds. Uh, after a while, it took this stance like this. So we loaded for a mission, and the mission was called off and delayed. The bombs had to be unloaded and loaded again to keep the landing gears uh, pretty well intact. That's the B-17F, I believe. The E, I think, had E. The E, that's an E? Okay. Then we had E, Fs, and Gs. Uh, the late Fs had the chin turret, and we used open waste windows. Did you have open waste at all? No. No, you did not. Okay. We had a letter on, our, on the tail after the first month, and one on the upper right wing, a square A. Uh, first division planes were a triangle with the letter, Second division was a circle with the letter, and third division was a rectangle with the letter. <clears throat> All right, about 12,000 B-17s were built. About 7,000 altogether were lost in combat. And about 30,000 men were lost in combat in Europe. Now, all the 17s that were lost were not lost in Europe, uh, but a good majority of them were. And uh, about uh, 30,000 men was about half of what the RAF lost. The RAF approached 70,000 overall. This is a letter that was given to every GI as he boarded the ship. It was a letter from President Roosevelt. Uh, why we were going over there. And we were given that on May 5th, 1943. On uh, me and Elizabeth. Uh, they told us we'd have state rooms, and I thought, two guys in the state room to ourselves. But they didn't tell us that there were going to be six bunks high, <laughs> and four of those, and we slept in three shifts. They, and then they told us uh, we're, we're, we'd see the swimming pool. We did see it. Well, our barrack bags were thrown into it. <laughs> And it's all, all you saw was a sea of green bags. Uh, just like when I went in, they told me, issued his hair and bone twill. I thought it was a sport coat. They were fatigues. So you have to watch what the Army tells you. <clears throat> all right, this isn't too clear, but this is the letter that Eisenhower sent to the groups taking part in the invasion. And they were distributed on June the 5th, 1944. This is the one who was sent out on BE Day. And uh, we each got one of those. Some people saved them and some didn't. I get a kick out of this. The mission of this Allied force was fulfilled May 7th. Now they're going to make this public. Well, look at top secret. <laughs> How the hell do you keep something like that top secret? They, they wanted the people to know it was over, but that's the Army. <laughs> this was a message from General Eubank, through, through him from General Arnold, about the Air Force being thanked for its contribution. And of course, this is a field war. This is the cover sheet, and the field order was probably the most important document that the Air Force used because it gave all the pertinent information that the air divisions had to have to send the planes on a mission. Uh, this was June 11, 1943, and when I sent away for this stuff, each sheet cost a quarter, and I think I got about a thousand sheets of stuff. Uh, I'll show you some strike photos after. Strike photos were a dollar a piece. 
and I don't have a lot of those. Number one, stride photos aren't the most beautiful thing to look at. A lot of smoke and haze, but uh, you see. Now this is the ticker tape that we had to learn to read. And I could read it. God, I don't know how he did it. But there are three perforations on one side and two on the other. And the locations of those dots meant a letter. Now a field order was probably a piece of paper, teletype, that ran from here to stop and shop. And we were supposed to read those things. We only did that for one mission. And then it was transmitted. When the ticker tape went through, it printed it on the screen. And you will see that. But we learned to do that. And uh, I don't know one single letter now at all. This is one of our planes, Shakaroo. Uh, the government was reluctant to send out pictures of planes with scantily cloud clad girls. And in fact, when the air inspector came, we, the guys would paint over the, they put a, a like a halter on with watercolors. <laughs> <laughs> and when it rained, we had the girls back <laughs> until the next visit. <laughs> this is the tents, or well, one of the tents in our living area. This is surrealistic in a way. It was taken Christmas morning, 1944, and the bulge was on then. Boy, it was cold. That's our squadron uh, insignia, and that little thing there is the latrine. And uh, there were four thrones in there, and no heat. And I swear to God, when I got home, I was going to enjoy using a bathroom. I mean, nobody's for you to read the Reader's Digest in that uh, Not at all. That's our squadron insignia just hanging there. And the order room would have been off to the side. Look. Okay. This is not part of a field order, but this is shows the position, the altitudes, and the remarks made by the group commander or one of these subordinates, but you can see the, the, uh, the details in this little bit of information right here. And I happen to put this in the wrong order, but it's there anyhow. All right, that's the first shot or sheet of a field order, and it was field order number eight from third division. It mentions fighter support. Uh, This main target, the primary, and they listed the primary in the code, and the secondary was industrial targets of opportunity. And the target of last resort, there wasn't one listed. But we had five targets, actually. Uh, the primary, the secondary, the tertiary, uh, the target of opportunity, and the target of last resort. So on many missions, uh, the crews had a good selection of targets in case the weather turned bad. Uh, all the groups assembled over certain towns. Uh, over Snedden Heath uh, and other towns. Down in Market. And this took up quite a bit of the field order. Just, just getting the planes into the... I don't know how they did it. Every group was sending up 40 or 50 planes. There were mid-air collisions, but when you think of the number of planes involved, and I'm sure this could be verified by a gentleman sitting right here, Harold? 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 Russ is gone. There weren't that many mid-air collisions in, in comparison I'm sorry, to- got my hearing aids are gone, or... Oh, they don't do the good. Courtesy of the B-17, I got them. Yeah, right. They're gone and being repaired. Oh, all right. But there weren't that many mid-air collisions when you consider the total number, and these were all flown by guys between 21 and 27. You're talking about mid-air collisions? Yes. 
5% of all of the year of carp were lost, or lost in the inner to be here. 5%? That is, it's, I mean, it's sound that way. It's not, that's not bad in comparison to the total number of planes in the air. And England is one of the worst places in the world uh, for flying. It's foggy half the time. And on the ground, you can put your, you can put your head down to the ground and see probably 500 feet. You get up one foot, you can't see anything. Nothing. And it was foggy a lot of the time, too. All right. I've got these reversed because this was sent. Uh, here, oh, wait. Whoa, whoa, whoa. <laughs> uh, it says someplace here, oh, this is field order number eight. It gives the primary and the secondary. And so the field order will follow them. I had the field order in front of this, but this was taken from Lieutenant Colonel Travis's uh, instructions. Okay, here's a good one. In the event, well, you can read it. I don't have to read it. Just go over it. sharks in the English Channel. 
But in the winter time, the cruise outings picked up very, very rapidly. This was a joint effort by the RAF and the United States. And for a while, we were exchanging our crews with German uh, ships that were doing the same thing. But it dawned on them, we're just returning guys to fight against us again. So we held on to the Germans, and they held on to ours. Uh, there was no exchange. Uh, this was made up by a uh, squadron commander as to who was flying in certain positions. Uh, start engines, there's the code for that, and taxiing. And there is one plane here that didn't make the final formation for some reason. Here it is when it was written. Oh, aircraft 97, this one here. Oh, well, I'm breaking this thing. This one, it was late in taking off and it failed to catch the rest of the formation, so she turned around. But this is a mission of January 5th, 1944. This is the weekly status report made out by the commanding officer uh, on a Friday or Saturday. It had to be sent down to 3rd Division, and I know you can't read it, but it's the status of personnel, the status of the planes, uh, what was going on in weekly operations, and the summary. And uh, he had to send this in faithfully every week. This is our group headquarters as it appeared in 1959, or part of it. It was a fairly long building. Uh, it was probably twice as long as what we see here. Uh, not much left of it now. This is an air raid shelter that we used once or twice. Uh, the Germans came over a few times and they dropped the chandelier flares, and they could take pictures then. And they came back once or twice. But the thing is, we didn't use them because it was loaded with rats. <laughs> and uh, the only way to become friendly with them offering one of your cigarettes. <laughs> but it was filled with water and rats. So we decided to take our chance outside and let the German planes just work, drop whatever they were dropping. But the rats were the size of puppies. <laughs> Okay, this was a flag that was going to be issued to our crews if they took part in a shuttle mission to Russia. And this is the obverse, and this is the reverse side here. We never issued them, and we had boxes of them. We never issued them because the missions to Russia were called off because the Russians would not allow American crews to land there. In fact, some American crews landed there and they were impounded like they were enemy. So the Russians were not, they might have been our allies, but they were not friendly. So we had these and we never issued them. All right, this is a report by the communications officer on one mission, and each of the sections had a hand to report into the commanding officer the operations man, the uh, communication, armament, and this is the one from the communication. <coughs> this is a navigation report of another mission by the group navigator. And he was sending this <coughs> to the operations officer. Sorry, what is Nikon? Flash of Beacons, number eight. Uh, uh, beacon. It should have been Beacon. Oh. I, I looked at it, what the hell is Beacon? <laughs> but that's what it was. Okay, this is a flat report on a target in June 43. Uh, the, the flat was not as bad then as it was later on. It was the fighters that our guys were worried about. I mean, to have two or three fighters come up at one time was a fairly common thing in 43. In fact, I took this down. I thought this would be interesting if I could find it. Okay, not a 
continuation function in that. Uh, in 1943, from May 1st to May 29th, in eight days of mission, we lost five planes. Now, in December of 1944, to January of 45, to uh, April of 45, from December of 44 to April of 45, we lost five planes. So, where we lost five planes in eight days in 43, we lost five planes in 72 missions in 45, so the change was pretty dramatic. All right, these are all aircraft malfunction reports on the top. And down here is combat damage. Combat damage uh, down here. Now this is four planes that did not come back. And there's the rest of them up here. Now this is combat damage of different, on different planes. And the mechanics had to go over these things with a fine tooth comb because a lot of them would be flying the next day if they could be put in shape. And we have an awful lot of what we call maximum effort missions where every plane that could and every man who could went. So getting them back in shape was a pretty important priority. Is that the, is that the uh, North Sea in the background that these pictures are on? It looks like Many, it, yes. Most it looks like water there. Yes. Yeah. Okay. No. No, yeah. not this. That's what I mean. No. No, it's just no. a it's generic uh, okay. background. Okay. Uh, this is on our field, and there's a square ray, as you can see up here. And just a pile and profile, look at the damage. The damage is on the left wing here, right here. And that was, well, January 11, 44. It was another squadron, not ours, but that's it. What was the covering on the B-17 wing? Aluminum or fabric? No, aluminum, except the control surfaces. They were... Uh, this is interesting. The ex ammunition expenditure for one mission, and you can see that the number of guns in each position and the number of rounds they fired, the total number of guns, 50 caliber, total rounds fired, and then planes that were lost, it even gives the ammunition and uh, bomb load of those, and they learned things from this thing. They learned from what position most of the attacks were coming. Uh, they learned to pick up a lot. If there were new tactics used by the Germans, they could pick that up just by the distribution of the shells, by the shots. I don't know what the total weight of it, but I know a box of 50 caliber ammunition was, was heavy. Anybody knows, but... And they only had about three or four minutes of straight firing time. I mean, they didn't have, you know, a lot extra. Uh, Total number of guns, 156. Total rounds. <coughs> total rounds <coughs> lost, 36,000. And total bomb lost, 300 pound bombs, 80. What does that mean by lost? Planes that went down. Okay. I tell you, the oh, English okay. Channel in the North Sea has got to be loaded with us. Uh, a hell of a lot of copper, huh? Copper and red. Okay, this is a combat form made out. Uh, it showed what gunners were claiming. And uh, <coughs> down here, it gives the disposition. This is a flight record from one of the navigators uh, on one of the missions <coughs> when they joined uh, like the composite group and flew out the entire mission until they got back. The, the times, all these things were reported. Hey, they did one hell of a job. This is a strike photo taken by a 390th bomb plane over 
warned Germany in April of 44, the group letter has been deleted and from the tail too. Uh, Sprite photos are notorious for not being good. They're not like sitting for a portrait. This is naval stores at Rennes, France, from P38 reconnaissance. And I hope nobody asked me anything about it because I don't know the thing. I mean, they're intelligent people study these things. They learn things from them. For you and me, it doesn't mean a hell of a lot, but that's one of the strike for uh, us. Here's something that a lot of people don't realize. Two crew members were killed on this particular mission. 21 moved to add 110 missing. Uh, most of those missing turned up being KIA because if you don't find, don't have the body, the guy is missing. But if a plane blows up and there's no shoots, those guys aren't listed as killed in action until that verification of them. They're missing. So we did a study one time and about half of the, what, a group lost. Uh, if 500 men went down, you could assume that about 250 lived and 250 did not. But that's... Uh, it mentions, oh, I, not this one, but another one, uh, B-17 turning around, going back to the, back to the continent, but some B-17s were, rec rec were taken over by the Germans, and they were marked with the Iron Cross, and they would stay with our formations as close as they could, and when the opportunity came, if it came, uh, to shoot our planes down. They did that on occasion. Uh, this is on a mission to St. Nazaire La Police in Rennes, France, on the same day. <clears throat> the first wing, the bomb groups, the second wing, and the third was, the fourth wing was ours. And it shows the personnel killed, wounded, or missing. See, the killed is zero, but look what the missing is here. Uh, down here, it's the same thing. One was lost, but 64 are missing. But most of those ended up being casualties. Uh, an aircraft not attacking, aircraft lost, uh, is listed. You can see the number of shoots that were out of service. And Many of them, no shoots, no shoots, no shoots. And the last four down here for our squadron, uh, Lieutenant Pomerant, Beacon, Drinkmeyer, and Dillard. Uh, that, and we never heard anything about any of them again. This is an interrogation report of a crew that did not come back. Obviously, it's not filled in because they didn't come back again. So the only thing you see on this one is the crew listed. Now this is not readable, but this is an interrogation report that was filled in when they did come back, another crew, and a lot of the stuff here, if you had the original, you, you could read it fairly well. Uh, it mentions, oh, here, tail gunner was wounded left arm, uh, top turret gunner, the pilot, and like waste. So they're pretty complete. Okay, this was in Life magazine, and this was one of our planes. You'll be able to see a square ray on the tip. One plane drifted underneath the other formation just as the bombs were being released. Oh boy. Now, you see this one here? All right, look what happened. Now, do you see a square ray on that tail? No. Right here. The bomb sheared this off, and the third uh, one 
the bombs that were coming down, some of them hit the fuselage and blew up. And those two crews were in the same hut, uh, which even made it worse. And the crew came back and they were a nervous wreck. It wasn't their fault, it wasn't anybody's fault. It was one of those accidents. Did they both, both planes go down? No, the, first, the, the one up above was completely free. Uh, we didn't have many of these to do because most of the deaths were in planes that went down. Once in a great while, uh, we would bring have a plane come back with not only wounded on board, but killed or wounded on board who later died. And this is one of them uh, was hit by a shell. And uh, he was buried in Brookwood Cemetery in Surrey, England. And all those bodies were later transferred to an American military cemetery in Cambridge, uh, Madly, and that's where all Air Force men are buried, except the ones who were brought home. This is a missing air crew report about one of the crews that went down, and this is the listing of the crew. And you see they're all killed. And this is the crew that this happened to. This, how many people remember Roger Van Dyke? In, uh, okay, Roger was a Vietnam Navy pilot, aviator. And this was his uncle here. And uh, I got to know Roger, and he was interested in seeing this, this photograph. Uh, this kid was from uh, Keokuk, Iowa. He was engaged and married. There's another crew we lost, and this young man here was from Hampton, Connecticut. His name is Carbonella. Joseph, and we graduated high school together. And the day that Roosevelt asked for a declaration of war, I turned to Joe in the study hall and I said, I think we're gonna go. And he said, I know we're gonna go. We were gonna go to London after his first, fifth mission. Uh, they went down on their fifth mission. This is the report on one of our downed pilots from the German government. And they called the machine fortresses. They didn't call B 17s but this is in German, and this one is more or less the same thing translated. Machine force shot down. May 5th is the wrong date on this. It should be May 29th. And these are the other men that he was found with. And they all end up being buried in the English cemetery at, at the North French. Grave numbers. Uh, this one is a fairly gruesome one, but uh, this is a, a, a disinterment report on this pirate. And uh, there wasn't too much that they could identify here with the bad body burnt, yes, very badly. Are any parts of the body missing? Leg, uh, yeah, arms and legs. And they couldn't identify it by the teeth because the skull was crushed. And when people ask for reports like this, that their own, it's their own relative, they very seldom get this. Why? In fact, I knew this fellow. And when I, when I got this years later, Irene said, You'd be better off if you had never even known that. Because I saw him walk out of the operation shack the morning. This crew went down. You remember the one about Bob Hope at the show? This crew was one of the three that went down on that day. Okay. And the last one, I believe, is this one. Not all crews perished. Many of them did not. And we had our own version of the Lucky Bastard certificate. And I was with the guy when he did this. If you see, you can't tell too well. There should be staple marks. He took a piece of onion skin paper, frayed the edges with a match, 
put a felt horseshoe here and with a 94 there and this is the shoulder patch and he made these certificates up and we thought the war would be over at 43 so we had to leave out the three later on so we could put in 44 and 45 but the gentleman who signed this is Frederick W. Castle who was commanding our commanding officer at the time and he later went down to 3rd Division and he, he was a Brigadier General and he was killed uh, December 24th, Christmas Eve of 1944. He's a West Point graduate and the fact that he is a Medal of Honor recipient is on a flag at West Point with all the other West Point graduates who uh, became heroes. Uh, the fellow that signed here, H. Colby, he was our CO. He was the oldest flying commanding officer in Europe. And that guy had a mouth on him that would have made a blowtorch seem calm. <laughs> One day, and I'm going to stop in a few seconds. One day, he sent me down to get a bomb site. So I had the bomb site in the, in the, in the Jeep. And he wanted it flown up, brought out to the pipeline. I went in to go to the bathroom, but the operations officer jumped into the Jeep and went to the officer's club. And Colby called, he says, where the hell is a bomb site? It's in the Jeep. He says, where's the Jeep? I said, I don't know. You should. He said, you could spend the next 20 years in this goddamn army. You know, we got the bomb site back. By that time, they canceled the mission. The CO didn't speak to me for weeks. So that is the end. And I want to thank you very much. Are there any memorials just to uh, your group or any cemeteries just for your group? Uh, no, the, the Air Force Museum in Dayton has a memorial park and each bomb group has a specific section. And there's one fighter group, just a three-bladed prop. I think it was a P-51 out there. But each group that wants to put something there can do it. Uh, the only other thing we have is this uh, museum, more or less, at Ruffle. Uh, there is a pub in one of the small villages called the Swan that uh, Glenn Miller used to frequent before he was lost. And that, they're so proud that Glenn Miller drank there <laughs> on occasion. But uh, no, the only two memorials I know is uh, Dayton. And there's more in Europe, people in Europe, in different places where, where 17s went down or P-51s, the people actually got together and made some small memorial. And they're all over Europe, actually. How about that large group of KIA or MIA went into the English Channel and were never recovered? Is there a memorial just there? They're listed on the wall. Uh, there's a wall of the missing at Mattingly which is the big American cemetery. Uh, yeah, there is, uh, there is that world, and there's enough of them there. You know what the RAF lost in the World War II? 70,000, just about double. They, they really paid. Ross? Question here. Um, when you started out being a novice to you know, military, you talked about um, the town of Rutham and a tower. Control tower. So what, and then the townspeople gave you a certain amount of uh, land to use. Around the town. But where did that tower come from? It was built by the construction firm uh, that made many of the airfields. It was a, oh, uh, it was a concrete building. Okay. And they were all the same. RAF and the United States used the same ones. Uh, many of our bases were patterned after Royal Air Force because the time was a big element there. But we had what was called a ready room where the English pilots used before they went. 
And our ready room wasn't big enough to hold 70 men. Uh, so a couple of fellows used it for smoking or sitting around, but uh, we didn't have the facilities. Uh, and the towers were not very high. What? The towers were very low. Low, very low. There were only two floors, and then there was like a greenhouse on top where they could observe. Uh, now, Bill Clark was lucky enough to be in an RAF field. They had everything but a swimming pool. <laughs> Maybe they had that, I don't know. And yeah, we had a swimming pool. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. How many men would you say were in uh, the Army Air Force in England? In England, I think the eighth ended up being over between, between combat crews and ground about a million. And how many men would you say were lost? the 8th Air Force? The 8th Air Force, they figure about, what, 33,000? Bill, what's that? More? What was the question? How many men were lost in the 8th Air Force in England? Roughly. 143,724. Killed in action. In England? In the 8th Air Force. In the 8th Air Force. Right, now, Harold wrote a book on this, so uh, I would have to Take his word, 140. Uh, there was a great large number, very large number. That would include fighters, too. Yeah, right. Do you know how we lost most of our fighter pilots? They drowned. They never could get back uh, over the channel. That lends itself to another question about the said that the missing. And your in one of the reports it was like zero listed, zero zero is dead. And the missing had to you had to they had to be veri it had to be verified. So how I mean if people went down in the in the channel, how do you verify? They never they never were verified. Okay. Uh, what did they do? Then did the missing change to kill after a while in the records? The men that were missing, were they classified again as killed in action after a number of years? They're not still listed as missing, are they? You mean the ones that were killed? No, the ones that they didn't know were killed. Missing. Well, they killed them, and they listed them as killed or missing in action. Oh, okay. And a lot of them survived. And, you know, they parachuted out right. and were captured. Right. Such as that. But that was a, the total of killed and missing, right? 140. Yeah. Once, a, once a plane goes down in the channel of the North Sea, then, you know, yeah. uh, unless a launch picks up some remains or, or they have, now with DNA, it's a lot easier. Oh, yeah. But uh, then it was. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. Yeah. Well, why don't you tell the people who don't know about the conditions that Reagan, Berg, and Swainford were shortly after the other one, and the German fighters would have to be on the ground being refueled, but the planes were late in getting to the target, and the German planes were fully refueled, and they caught them good. And Schweinfurt, we lost almost 60-some six, odd planes, but 600 men. You know, I saw, a lot of people have seen this probably, I saw two B-17s collide uh, over Cambridge, and all you see is this huge black pump, and then it's like confetti coming down. And you're looking at something that was 20 human beings, and there's nothing. Question? Uh, sorry. When I hear the stories about Schweinfurt, the law bearing factory, if the people in America realize if the war was reversed, and they were bombing us. Do you know what the target would have been? Bristol, Connecticut. Bristol, Connecticut. Bristol, Connecticut. Yeah, that was the Mulberry factory here compared to theirs. And any other questions? This question back there. Rush. For word. An airman who parachuted out, shot at by um, German fighter pilots while they were in the air. I never heard of a case like that. Uh, I know in Pacific is verified that that did happen, but I don't think that, uh, in fact, <clears throat> I have a print, shows a B-17 in difficulty in an ME-109 
came up alongside of him, and they, he said, I will escort you to the closest allied field, but I won't go near it myself. Yeah. But, and he showed him where the field was. No, I think that the German, German Air Force was pretty ethical, weren't they? Well, Goring said that. Goring was so impressed in World War I how we treated the Red Baron, the military funeral, he said officers didn't have to work when they were in concentration camps, I mean in uh, prison war camps, and he always made sure that his pilots wouldn't do anything bad because he appreciated that. The only, the only exception to that, there, we had a young fighter pilot from California uh, who was shot down and he was pitchforked to death by civilians. Oh, and uh, I, I don't, I think that happened on a, you know, when you think about it, if somebody had raided Cheshire and killed 30 or 40 children here, and one of them came down in a parachute, you'd almost be inclined to do the same thing. Just like on D-Day, when you see the pictures of the paratroopers getting shot in the chutes, you say, well, how could they do that? <coughs> if we were reversed and it was Germans dropping on us, we would do the same thing. If war is cruel, there's no easy uh, answer at all. In your squadron, did you ever have what was known as a hangar queen? We used to take the parts. We all had we all had planes that we uh, that we kept. Uh, you know, I walked into the engineering shack one day. Now, you know, the, on the yoke of a 17, it says B, 17 Flying Fortress. They had a bucket full of those things from airplanes that were scrapped. And the, uh, the fellow in the uh, engineering shack said, "Do you want to take a handful?" A handful, you know what they be worth now? You can't find them now. And I could have had a handful of them. And like a dope, I couldn't take them. Who the hell knew? Question here. Yes. I just brought, how, old, how old were you when you went over? I was 18. 18? But you know, it's not the guys on the ground, like how young we were. When you take a look at those planes and the guys who were flying them, I hate to think of things being turned over to some 19 and 20 years old you see today. I wouldn't turn a kiddie car over. But these guys learned to fly them. And you know, a friend of mine used to say he was a private pilot. No, no military experience. He would say to me when there were no combat guys around, oh, anybody could fly a P-17. I said, then why did it take them so long to train them? I said, besides that, just no one is shooting at you when you go up. <laughs> when they went up, people were trying to kill them. And we, uh, uh, all the time, in two and a half years and 324 missions, I never knew of one single guy in our squadron who asked to be taken off flying status. A lot of them went to rest homes for a week or two, but no, I never saw, and that takes guts. Russ, did you ever have fighter planes accompany you on a, uh, a mission? Yes, they had Spitfires going in and a Luftwaffe coming up. But <laughs> later on, they had P-47s and they didn't have the range to do it. So when the P-51s came out, they escorted them all the way in and all the way back. Hey, boy. And you know, we had the drop tanks that were resin tanks. We had aluminum drop tanks at first, but the Germans were picking them up. They would try to make our fighter planes drop the drop tanks. And they had no, no, uh, no fuel left. They had to come back. But we had the resin tanks. They went all, all the way, P-51s. 